Welcome to the Claire Auden Podcast. In this series, The Narc Behind the Educator, I and fellow narcissism educators discuss and share our own personal journeys with the narcissist and narcissistic abuse in our own lives. Roman, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. It's good to have you here. I love the way that you break down narcissistic abuse and CPTSD. I think your explanations are amazing. I want to make it accessible to the common listener. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm yeah, it's best. really good. <laughs> so you had a 15 year marriage to a narcissist, but that wasn't the relationship that inspired you to start going down this path. Absolutely not. When I was finished with my relationship with the narcissist, I was like, good, I'm done. Like, I don't want to. Okay think about narcissism. I don't want to talk about narcissism. That was the darkest thing I had Mm -hmm. ever experienced. Uh, It's uh, frightening to me how cruel humans can be to one another, especially their loved ones. So Mm -hmm. uh, no, I knew the one thing I didn't want to do was uh, be a coach on narcissism or to teach people Mm -hmm. about narcissism. Uh, But it was it was the next relationship that really uh, inspired me to get involved in what I'm doing now as a trauma specialist. Okay. So tell me a little bit about your marriage and then we'll go on to that one. Mm -hmm, Of course. Um, How did you guys meet? So we, we all, we knew each other from six years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. We were in the same first grade class Mm -hmm. and I was a class clown and she was a mean girl from through grade school and middle school. And so I was always like poking fun at her. So we had more of an adversarial relationship through school. We became Mm -hmm. close in high school when we were both Mm -hmm. in uh, the remedial math class and we started to bond and I started talking to her. I was surprised at her depth uh, because I sort of judged her as being shallow. And Mm -hmm. uh, next thing you know, we we hit it off. We had a friendship. Uh, We would talk every day for like hours from 14 years old until I was. 21 when we got married oh wow okay so she was the only relationship that you'd had at that point yeah so how soon in did she start to change when did you start to notice some of the narcissistic behaviors so that's an interesting question i mean she was always like i said a mean girl <laughs> so i wasn't didn't a red flag. <laughs> Yeah, she was a red, she had red flags, but I didn't understand <laughs> that what I was looking at was a potential yeah. mate that was going to use me. You understand? Mm. So um yeah. the way that I grew up looking at women is influenced mm-hmm. by my parents' marriage. And my okay. mother is probably somewhere on that narcissistic spectrum. And then I have the codependent stepfather that I was raised by. Oh wow. Okay. And so I learned um the concept that I subconsciously gathered is uh, women will be uh, crazy or uh, act in ways that are uh, extreme uh, and dramatic. And and that's fine. And we need to just deal with that, you know? And so not really realizing how uh, codependency and mental health and mental illness works. I didn't know I'm Mm -hmm. watching an enabler in my stepfather and Mm. a person on the spectrum of narcissism with my mother. So when I'm seeing dramatic, crazy behavior Mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, not to use that term, but something Mm -hmm. unacceptable behavior Mm -hmm. in my uh, wife when we were young, I just took it, uh, you know, on, on the chin, as they say, like, it just rolled off me like, okay, this is how women will be. So those understand. red flags were so familiar that you didn't really see them. Yeah, I didn't think she was anything like my mom. It's just the fact that I was overly tolerant of mm-hmm. unacceptable behavior in the opposite sex. Okay, so what kind of behaviors did you see? When, uh, when we were kids, uh, <laughs> she was elitist. <laughs> Um, okay. she was jealous. So mm-hmm. like if I had, we were, we would be only 
friends, not even dating, but if I mm-hmm. showed interest in another woman, then she would insert herself into the relationship. Um, mm-hmm. uh, just, just things like that. Lots of, uh, she um, would do extreme things in a disagreement. Uh, like one time she, uh, what we call ghosting today, where she didn't speak to me for an entire summer over wow. literally nothing. Uh, okay. You know, so, um, so I did see red flag behavior, but I didn't understand. Uh, she had a short temper also, very short temper, but I didn't understand mm-hmm. uh, that this is something that she would deal with for the rest of her life. I thought that mm-hmm. with love and care and, uh, and a non-toxic household, uh, she would get better and she would yeah. flourish. And yeah. that was incredibly naive of her. Yeah, I think a lot of people that end up with narcissists think that they can love them better. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> yeah. So what were some of the behaviors that you saw once you guys were married? Uh, so it's the constant contentions. So mm-hmm. there's always something wrong. Uh, she's always uh, tense, bitter, upset, uh, mm-hmm. complaining, um, mm-hmm. and it's always either my fault or she's complaining to me about how someone else has uh, disappointed her. Uh, okay. And so it's that constant state of unhappiness that is a symptom of narcissism in females, but I didn't yeah. understand it as that. Um, mm-hmm. My thought is I need to improve as a husband. So so let me yeah. improve our circumstances. Let me move us to a new place or make more money or you yeah. know, uh, try to listen to the things, the criticisms that she's giving me and take mm-hmm. them uh, to heart. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know that the criticisms were just a constant unending flow of deflection uh, yeah. so that uh, I would believe that I am the problem as narcissists all tend to have that agenda uh, yeah. to make their, their mates believe. 100%. So, so also you... there's, a, there's a lack, lack oh. of affection, lack of accountability, lack of empathy, you know, that sort of thing. So when did you realize that it was more than just the crazy way that women are? It was 10 years of changing everything and fixing everything where I had mm. achieved every goal that I could yeah. have achieved and given everything that I could have given, uh, mm-hmm. fulfilled every promise. And mm-hmm. she was as unhappy, if not more than ever. Okay. <laughs> now I had to figure out, okay, what really am I dealing with here? And I started researching mental illness and mm-hmm. I didn't, I, again, I'd never heard of narcissism. Mm-hmm. And so it was a site I stumbled on. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name, Dr. Pomartier, she talked about mm-hmm. narcissism in women. And that was okay. rare to find someone writing about that. And she nailed it. Uh, she described my wife to a T. And I'm like, I found it. This is it. And of course, at first, there's an optimism like, oh, great, there's a name for this. So yeah. now all we have to do is is find a therapist to, to fix her and then we'll be good. And then mm-hmm. I find myself on the phone with therapist after therapist and they're letting me know, mm. no way we don't even touch narcissists. And wow. It's like, wow, okay. what, what am I dealing with here? <laughs> and I spent yeah. the next five years finding out. So wow. I stayed in the marriage and moved my emotions and just observed in scientist mm-hmm. mode. And so mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure that, uh, that my wife could not be helped, that mm-hmm. there was no cure for this, that, um, that she was uh, determined and beyond that point of being able to reconcile or save mm. in some way. And so what I, what did you really mean by moving your emotions? Time. So I emotionally disconnected uh, 100%, okay. which means I'm no longer um, chasing love. I'm no longer okay. cultivating a romantic love. Uh, mm-hmm. I kept principled love, of course which is uh, human humanity, you know, kindness. Mm-hmm. Um, but I removed um, the feeling of being wrapped up in whatever the issue was or trying to fix the issues mm-hmm. between us, uh, wanting things to be better, wishing 
for improvement and just observed it as it actually was. I wanted to become an expert on it so that I knew for sure that I wasn't just uh, walking away from a marriage that could have been saved or could have been helped if I would have done something else. So when you stopped emotionally reacting, did her behavior initially escalate? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Her, her behavior <laughs> went from bad to worse. Um, yeah. And uh, the abuse just intensified her, her constant state of anger uh, was, was more intense. It was based on even more trivial things. And, uh, so you nailed it, Claire. As soon as I emotionally detached, uh, she got worse, which yeah. from a scientific standpoint, because I was observing her, I was okay with, because now okay. I'm not being hurt by mm. her, um, uh, her verbal abuse, for instance, because yeah. I'm emotionally disconnected and okay. I, and I would set firm boundaries with her as well. And not that she would respect them, but mm. uh, she definitely saw that she wasn't able to get away with as much. Yeah, because I think people can definitely feel like initially gray rock is kind of backfiring. It That means it's working. Yeah. <laughs> you're, right, you're in opposite world with the narcissist. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> you're doing something right, you'll get punished. Right? Yeah, and mm -hmm. you, for any listeners, remember that. If you're doing mm -hmm. something right, you get punished. That's how you know you're yeah. doing something right. Yeah. But don't oh. say, oh, I can't because they punish me. No, no, mm -hmm. then that's what you, because that is exactly what they don't want you to do, which mm -hmm. means you're doing right by you. You're setting the boundaries. You're representing yourself well. You're not tolerating uh, any unnecessary uh, bad behavior from them. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's going to get worse. And that doesn't mean it's not working. That means you're nailing it. It is working. How did that relationship end? Um, I didn't believe in divorce for mm -hmm. uh, religious reasons. So mm -hmm. I um, needed to see that the person actually cheated. And wow. then based on those grounds, I felt comfortable uh, ending the marriage. And um, I heard on, I don't know if it was uh, uh, something I read, but an expert mm -hmm. on narcissism said, narcissists always cheat. And I thought, okay. oh, wow, this may actually hit its end. There may be an end to this. And sure okay. enough, uh, I opened my eyes and observed. And it wasn't long before uh, I did catch her and had a legitimate basis to end the relationship. Wow. Do you think all narcissists cheat? Because I know that's a big question for a lot of people. Yeah, I don't overgeneralize. Uh, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, what we know is that they have the capacity to cheat mm -hmm. because of their lack of empathy, lack of personal accountability, uh, disconnect mm -hmm. from their morals and values. Uh, so you, you should expect that they would given the opportunity. Okay. Uh, so that's the thing is, do they even have the opportunity? So mm -hmm. given the opportunity, it's it's likely yeah <laughs> it's like yeah okay so you ended that relationship did you feel like you were trauma bonded i was not trauma bonded um what i struggled with was codependency which okay. i define as fear of being alone and mm -hmm. uh, a, a constant incessant need to have another person in order for you to be complete and so many of us are raised culturally to feel like if you're not married, you're nothing, you know, you have yeah. to have a gal by your side and then, mm -hmm. and then you're at something. So you're not valid. You don't even want to show up to like a family dinner, you know, without mm -hmm. someone uh, so it's rooting out those old beliefs and ideas that, that if I'm alone, it's a bad thing so that I can mm -hmm. actually embrace being alone, uh, be comfortable, be excited, be happy being alone. And mm -hmm. then the codependency dies. And when the codependency is dead, then you don't feel like you need to tolerate unacceptable behavior anymore. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's why being alone can be a bit of a superpower because you're not putting up with the red flags. You're not putting up with the bad behavior because you're comfortable. It's imperative and it's something I stress in my uh, healing course 
Mm-hmm. And in my healing program for survivors mm-hmm. is uh, learning to reframe what being alone is. Solitude is mm-hmm. a good thing, mm-hmm. is a positive thing, it's healthy. It's not going to hurt you. And this is where uh, a lot of coaches fall short because they rely mm-hmm. on uh, the importance of connection, the importance of mm-hmm. support system. They crutch so mm-hmm. much on that that they yeah. don't teach survivor the importance mm-hmm. of standing alone and being fine. Because yeah. when you have that, then the smear campaign doesn't kill you. Then mm-hmm. the idea of leaving this person and setting boundaries and enforcing those boundaries, which is always just being able to walk away, then yeah. that becomes a viable option. So 100%. yeah, learn to be alone. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I definitely push that with my clients as well. I think um, it would be really helpful if you could illustrate some of the differences right now between codependency and trauma bonding. Yeah, with trauma bonding, uh, you're basically, it's it's a term that's used to describe loving someone or something that's not good for you. Mm-hmm. That's a trauma bond. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't make sense. So that's why we created mm-hmm. a, a special term for it. It's illogical. Yeah. And it's the antithesis of love in that you're actually, it's harmful to you. Whereas mm-hmm. love should be beautiful and it should be healthy and, and it should be yeah. benevolent. But yeah. instead a trauma bond is, uh, is pathological, uh, mm-hmm. meaning you're doing it despite the fact that it doesn't make sense anymore. So when someone's trauma yeah. bonded, uh, that means that they're loving a person who is bad for them, who is toxic for them, even mm-hmm. though it's beyond the point of being beneficial to them. With uh, codependency, again, now we're just talking about your inability to stand alone and be okay with that. Uh, viewing being alone as a bad thing or fearing being alone and Mm -hmm. uh, needing another person as a crutch uh, for either your self-esteem, your self-worth, or uh, to feel valid as a person, to feel complete. You feel that you need other people or another person in your life. Mm. Okay. So let's talk about the relationship that did inspire you to go down this path. Yeah. So once I was out of my marriage, it was the next relationship. Uh, I fell in love with a wonderful, empathetic woman. And so she would be like the empath, as people call it. Uh, Yet she had these symptoms that she was dealing with uh, that were very much different than anything I saw in my wife. So I felt Mm -hmm. so safe with her, uh, yet Mm -hmm. she was suffering more than I realized. Uh, these symptoms I'm okay. talking about are people pleasing, um, mm-hmm. hypervigilance. She was in constant anxiety. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was her symptoms of complex trauma because she okay. was raised by a narcissistic mother. And many okay. narcissistic mothers are brutal to their mm-hmm. daughters, as this one was to my then girlfriend. So that was the relationship that made me want to understand what it was I was seeing in her as I saw her deteriorate and and self-sabotage and sabotage Mm -hmm. the relationship for no logical reason. Uh, Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how to help people like her. Mm. And what ways did she, yeah. And what was the relationship and how soon into the relationship did these behaviors start to show up? Um, after about the six month mark, um, it was like she was looking for an out, okay. uh, which is odd because mm. we weren't having any problems. Mm. <laughs> it was good, but you want to mm. leave. Yeah. So it's like, okay, do you not like me? Do you not love me? No, it's not that. It's like, what is it? You know, well, there's just mm. something wrong. Well, well, what's wrong? And there's never a logical basis or reason for it. Um, mm-hmm. She um, started to um, smear me and okay. the reason why a a um an empath will do this a a trauma survivor uh they're not smearing like the narcissist does uh okay. but they do their own devaluation or um uh of the person because um they want to feel validated in their desire to leave or their decision um, to go okay the reason yeah. they're leaving is because they're afraid that it mm-hmm. is going to become abusive and they are going to lose themselves, even mm-hmm. though at this moment it's not abusive 
and mm. you wouldn't make them lose themselves. Uh, but they're afraid that that other shoe is going to drop. So they start trying to find that out because the anxiety is too much. The fear mm. of this inevitable collapse is too much. And so mm. they go to other people and they start uh, giving a negative spin of you and the relationship to other people so that those people could say, maybe you should break up. And then they could say, do you think so? Uh, because they yeah. are external. Users. They need that external validation for their decisions and mm -hmm. for their desires. And so uh, that was another self-sabotaging thing that I, I saw her start to do. So she was devaluing me um, mm -hmm. and trying to sabotage or find a, a basis or a reason to, to be able to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and at this point, did you have any understanding of CPTSD? Oh, we no, I had no idea. Again. I had no, I was blind again. I was yeah. like, what is this? No, this is something <laughs> totally different. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, with mental illness, uh, I don't know if anyone can relate to me, but I grew up thinking mm -hmm. that mental illness was the person on the bus stop that's talking to themselves mm -hmm. or someone was yeah. they had a dog that was seeing things that weren't there. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. what I understood as mental illness. I didn't understand that the person next to you, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your best friend is also seeing things that aren't there, uh, not mm -hmm. in terms of hallucination, but in terms of cognitive distortion. They yeah. are personalizing, they are blaming, they are overgeneralizing, they are reading mm -hmm. your mind, they are fortune telling. So they think mm -hmm. they know things that they are that they don't know. And they see yeah. things that aren't really there. So I, mm -hmm. I didn't understand that really healthy seeming people were also struggling uh, with yeah. mental illness. So what else started to happen in that relationship? How did you handle it? Well, Six months was... in, she starts creating distance and you're not sure what's going on. Well, I was able to hold, I was able to hold her in with uh, fierce logic for another six <laughs> months. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually, uh, just with no logical basis uh, that I know of, uh, mm. she ghosted. Okay. And, wow. Uh, obviously, that that's a trauma in itself. Yeah, it was mm. very traumatic for me yeah. because I loved her wholeheartedly. Mm. And we were talking about marriage and, and life together. So yeah, um, I wanted to utilize the pain that mm. I felt uh, as, as impetus to uh help to relieve the pain that survivors like her feel uh mm -hmm. because now that she had given me a trauma i was mm -hmm. feeling anxiety uh and even though it's acute according to um in comparison to what she's experienced it mm -hmm. still helped me to get a deeper level of empathy for how much she must have been suffering uh yeah with her fear that there was going to be something bad that was going to happen mm. in this relationship. Yeah. And so I wanted to really be able to learn one, so I could help her if I ever got in contact with her again, but mm -hmm. also so I could help others because this, that others are, are feeling like she's feeling are struggling, like she's struggling mm -hmm. are suffering. And I wanted to be able to do something. So did this also start out with Googling symptoms to try and figure it out? When did you realize what Absolutely. had been going on? <laughs> Absolutely. YouTube, YouTube uh, yeah. was extremely helpful. And suddenly okay. I'm seeing these and now very, not very popular videos, but they're explaining mm -hmm. CPTSD, what this is in the United mm -hmm. States. We don't have that. CPTSD isn't in the diagnostic manual for our profession. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, really. So, wow. so this means that all of the people and there's millions who are suffering mm. from CPTSD in the United States yeah. do not get the proper diagnosis. They will either just be diagnosed with anxiety or depression mm -hmm. or mm. A bipolar. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, or bipolar or borderline is the common one. Mm. Uh, for, but uh, the, the proper diagnosis for so many of these survivors is CPTSD, which is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. They were mm. traumatized. In their childhood, mm -hmm. they were kept like prisoners of war in yeah. circumstances that children are supposed to grow up in yeah. and now have maladaptations that they need help to mm -hmm. reacclimate and adapt so that they can go into this world and have connectedness and joy and peace and confidence mm -hmm. and a sense of well-being. 
So for the listeners, what are some of the differences between PTSD and CPTSD? The difference between PTSD and complex PTSD is complex Mm -hmm. is there were multiple traumas over a sustained period of time. PTSD Mm -hmm. can just be one trauma. You got in a car accident, Mm -hmm. you were robbed once, or you were were, uh, in combat one time. And so you Mm -hmm. see something traumatic, you experience something traumatic, and then you have Mm -hmm. PTSD, which is a lot of similar symptoms, but uh, CPTSD tends to be uh, deeper, more entrenched, uh, and more involved on all aspects of your life. So you're not Mm -hmm. just ducking when you hear a gunshot, you are constantly in fear that the Mm -hmm. person you're talking to is going to be your abuser. And you are more comfortable with people who are clearly abusive and you Mm -hmm. are hurting yourself. Uh, You're Mm -hmm. harming yourself by your, by your decisions and you're in constant uh, anxiety, regulation, flashbacks, you know, all of it. Is that for a sense of predictability that people would rather see it coming than be in that uncertainty? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's just, it's dysregulating for, for them to be in a relationship with someone who they believe will abuse them or hurt Mm -hmm. them but the person won't abuse them and hurt them. Mm. That is more frightening to them than mm. a person who just abuses them. Because it's like, if you yeah. abuse me, it's like, oh, okay, well, I expect this yeah. because that's how my mom yeah. treated me. That's how my mm-hmm. dad treated me. Mm-hmm. But when you're with a person who's like, no, no, I'm nice. I'm kind. I'm loving. I'm not going to hurt you. Mm. You're like, oh my God, this guy, waiting for the other is, to dr- they're really yeah. going to hurt me. This is one of the bad, the really bad yeah. ones with all the kindness and their love and yeah. all of that. No way. I don't trust it for a minute. Not yeah. Yet, so that's, yeah. Their, that's their mind. And I think that everyone who comes out of a long-term relationship with a narcissist feels like that. They're constantly waiting for the mask to fall off. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, um, it makes an impact. Uh, mm. But the key to overcoming your trauma is to not allow yourself to be permanently changed in an undesirable way as a result mm. of the trauma, which means mm. that we do need to choose to trust again. We do need to give people opportunities because if you're not yeah. giving anyone opportunities, i.e. being avoidant, that's not healed. Mm. You are not mm. healed. Saying, I'm done with all men or I'm done mm-hmm. with all women. That's not healed. Yeah. That's that's overgeneralization. That's a trauma yeah. symptom. Hundred uh, percent. You know you're healed when you say, "Yeah, there's good people, there's bad people. Mm-hmm. I'll give people a chance. I've got so my true. boundaries. My boundaries will keep me safe." Mm-hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, what was your journey from researching all of these things to actually coaching and actually helping people heal? Uh, It's virtually simultaneous. I I have a background in counseling. I've been pastoral Mm -hmm. counseling and youth counseling since I was 15. So Mm -hmm. that's always been my thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Once I was starting to learn and as soon as I figured out, for instance, how to cure anxiety, I immediately Mm -hmm. uh, started taking clients who had anxiety to start putting this into practice and testing it in the field. And then once I saw success at that, we worked with the depression, success of that. Mm-hmm. And I just kept build, building until I had the full uh, CPTSD healing program. Wow. That's amazing. Did you ever see her again? Uh, my ex-girlfriend? Yeah. With CPTSD? I have not seen her. She, she, okay. She's the ghost. <laughs> I was just wondering. Okay. <laughs> so... I feel like building that online presence gives you a lot of opportunity to meet people with different types of backgrounds. When you started doing this, was it mainly local or was it mainly remote online? I started locally uh, Mm -hmm. only for maybe a couple months just so I could test uh, what I'm doing one-on-one with uh, people in my local area. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was building the online uh, base with YouTube, TikTok, and things like that. Uh, So it was an inevitability after a few months that I started connecting with people around the world. Mm. That's amazing. So walk me through some of the stuff that you do in your programs. So uh, for instance, if someone enrolls in my uh, healing program, there's an online video course. 
and they mm-hmm. go through the the course and it teaches them uh, how to integrate the split self, uh, mm-hmm. which for any who don't know what that means, um, a lot of times trauma survivors have a part of themselves over here, the, the more mean, uh, aggressive part, and then mm-hmm. the nice front here. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they don't know which one they are at what time, uh, mm-hmm. which is akin to uh, DID, dissociative identity disorder. Uh, mm-hmm. So we learn first to integrate, uh, then we learn how to cure our own anxiety uh, using a pen and paper. Whenever you're mm-hmm. feeling anxiety, to sit down mm-hmm. and work through the process so that your mm-hmm. anxiety can drop. Um, depression, uh, then we he- we heal the self-worth, the self-esteem, mm-hmm. uh, we build the confidence, uh, we heal the loss of self, we show you how to find yourself again, mm-hmm. uh, we show you how to live in purpose, and um, and then there's so much other really cool stuff that, that you can learn uh, how to overcome. And I have a video on every symptom of CPTSD on my YouTube, and I'm still uh, uh, adding. So there's like 200 videos there for free that people oh, wow. can. Okay, that's great. Absolutely. But how it's all about is... solution. Yeah. How important do you think finding a purpose is? Essential. Mm-hmm. Uh, you cannot heal without purpose and mm-hmm. healing is not your purpose. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so a lot of times a uh, client will say, okay, well, what's your purpose? And they say, I just want to heal. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, that's great. But mm-hmm. if you if you want to stay balanced, which is healing, mm-hmm. healing is balanced. If you want to stay mm-hmm. balanced on a bicycle, uh, when someone says, where are you going on this bike? You don't say, mm-hmm. I just want to stay up on the bike. Yeah. Because if you try to stay up on a bike without going anywhere, you'll tip to yeah. the side. The momentum yeah. of moving forward is what keeps you balanced on a mm-hmm. bicycle. It's the same in life. You need momentum in a certain direction. You need to be going mm-hmm. somewhere. So mm-hmm. I'm starting a podcast. There's a purpose. I have a ministry. Mm-hmm. Is a purpose. I'm going yeah. to uh, learn, find a cure for this or uh, invent this or create this. Pick something mm-hmm. that's going to be worthwhile for you to pursue over the next three to 600 days uh, that's mm-hmm. obtainable, that's beneficial for you and mankind and go for it. And as mm-hmm. you're moving forward and focusing on that, then it you have the healing that is Mm -hmm. a byproduct of the balance that you are creating because you have momentum in a certain direction. Your purpose is your due north. So -hmm. without a purpose, you don't know what is a beneficial decision and what is not. Should Mm -hmm. you get married? It depends on your purpose. Should you Mm -hmm. buy a car? Should you buy a house? It depends on your purpose. Should you hang Mm -hmm. out with your friends tonight or work on your book? It depends on your purpose. There is no Mm -hmm. right and wrong answer. It mm-hmm. is based on your purpose. That is your due north to then know what is an adaptive and healthy decision for you. Yeah. So you have 100%. to. Have yeah. to. I think that a lot of people really struggle with this one, particularly when they're coming out of an abusive relationship. Who are they and what is their purpose going to be? Do you have any advice for people in starting to figure those things out? Yes. Deepen your sense of your own personal authority. Uh, Mm -hmm. You are appointed as the sovereign of your resources. Understand Mm -hmm. what your resources are, time, Mm -hmm. uh, your money, your attention, your Mm -hmm. energy, your personal space, your beauty, your body, your talent, Mm -hmm. your skills, your children, uh, and any material goods you have. Those are your resources. Mm -hmm. They belong to you. No Mm -hmm. one has the right to those resources Many people want a piece of your resources. No one has the right. Many people want some of that. Every relationship is a transaction of resources. So you are saying, Mm -hmm. I'll give you my time and energy. I need some of your love, affection, and your access to your body. We're making exchanges. Uh, So you have to understand your personal authority. When Mm -hmm. you understand that you are the boss, and now you don't need to be looking to someone else for what you should do, then you need to decide how you're going to use your resources. You are a raw Mm. material. So Mm. you need to decide, okay, how will I put this raw material into use? Yeah. So then you pursue purpose by choosing purpose. Yeah. A lot of what you're describing really comes down to having good, strong boundaries. Yes, absolutely. You have to have a good sense of self. Which is another thing that people struggle with. Yeah. Exactly. It's all intertwined, right? It's all big. (laughs) So we start at a certain point, we teach you about this, 
and but yeah. everything's going to be interconnected. It's all going to come back to each other. Absolutely. Mm. And so mm. right at the core is purpose. So if you're thinking, I want to heal, or I don't know if I'm healed yet, what is your purpose? You should be able to um, name that right off the bat. Know what you're doing. Know what you're working mm -hmm. on. And you have to be pursuing it on a daily basis. And um, and that gives you, and then you need to hinge all of your decisions on that, including your relationships. Everything needs to align with the purpose. Mm -hmm. Where you're going, what you're doing, what you're seeing needs to align with your purpose. Mm -hmm. Now you're living a life of actualization and alignment when you know where you're going, what you're trying to do and base mm -hmm. all of your decisions on that. Yeah. So the two previous relationships that we talked about in the beginning of the interview really helped put you on track to walk in your purpose. Definitely a purpose-driven person, but mm -hmm. I chose this purpose when I saw that there were people suffering. This was mm -hmm. the perfect niche for me because I, I have the answers for this particular group. Like I, I am right there with you guys. So it's like, okay, I got you. I know what you guys need. And I mm. love you so much uh, because mm. again, that, that woman was the love of my life. Right. So mm. I see her in all of my clients as they express mm. uh, things that they're thinking, the ways that they're thinking, the things that they're feeling. Uh, and I'm yeah. learning more about her every day by working with other survivors who have these same symptoms. So it's a labor um, of love and it's a purpose I've chosen because it's just 360 beneficial. Yeah, that's amazing. So what advice would you give to someone who is realizing that they're in a relationship with a narcissist? Immediately find the exit. Okay. Immediately locate the exit. Yeah. So, so even if they're married? <laughs> that's um, a big one for some people. <laughs> yeah. So, so we have, we all have different viewpoints on marriage. Some people believe mm -hmm. you can get divorced for incompatibility and some have mm -hmm. the more strict view that I have. Um, so if you're in a marriage with a narcissist, you still need to leave, but you need to leave emotionally. Uh, because okay. if you continue to put your emotions into this relationship, the, in the same manner you used to, you're exposing yourself to emotional neglect, emotional mm -hmm. abandonment and abuse. Mm. So yes, you still need to leave the relationship. You have to first leave emotionally. Um, mm -hmm. Once you have solid grounds based on your beliefs that uh, you are able to uh, get out of the marriage, uh, mm -hmm. understand that there's a difference between separation and divorce. Divorce mm -hmm. is a legal proceeding. Don't stay mm -hmm. living with your narcissist waiting for a divorce. Uh, okay. Leave. Get your own source of income, your own bank account, your own mm -hmm. shelter, and go. You don't need mm -hmm. to stay living with them. And then you can worry about the divorce, which is just a lawsuit later. So mm. find the exit. Everyone has different circumstances, different beliefs. Find the exit. Don't talk about, mm. well, I can't because of this. Mm. That's focus on what you cannot do. Focus mm -hmm. on what you can do. Well, perhaps I can call this person. Perhaps I can go to a shelter. Perhaps I can do this. Perhaps I can do that. It is real. The mm -hmm. abuse that you're experiencing, even if it's not physical, emotional mm -hmm. and verbal abuse and mental abuse, i.e. Mm -hmm. gaslighting, it's real. And it yeah. has a real detriment and a real effect. You need to protect yourself. If you're still mm -hmm. there uh, temporarily, uh, don't give information and obviously learn what gray rocking is. Mm -hmm. Information is power. Knowledge is power. Don't give any information about yourself, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, where you're going, what you're doing who you're with, you know, don't give any of that to the narcissist because it mm. can and will be used to get you. And of course, don't tell the narcissist that you understand they are a narcissist. You think they are a narcissist, that they need help, um, that something is their fault. Uh, just Can you explain to the listeners why not to tell the narcissist they're a narcissist? I get this question a lot. I'd like to hear your input, your reasoning. Um. Well, the, the very essence of narcissistic personality disorder is I'm not the problem, you're the problem. So the response yeah. you're going to get is I'm not a narcissist, you're a narcissist. <laughs> or well, I don't see the problem with being a narcissist. That makes me mm. smart, that makes me better, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Mm. So there, there is no value to it. And the only reason mm. we would tell someone something is wrong is because 
uh, it's constructive criticism. They could potentially use it for their advantage uh, yeah. to get better. Narcissists mm. aren't going to use you calling them a narcissist to get better for you. Mm. Uh, they're not looking to heal. They don't believe yeah. anything is wrong. With them, so it is therefore futile to point out that something mm -hmm. is wrong with them. What's better is to recognize what it is and then find the exit. Leave the relationship as soon as possible and do it yeah. quietly. They don't need to know that you are leaving until you are already in your car, far away from the house, and then you call them and you let them know, mm -hmm. "Hey, uh, I decided um, that you know I'm going to leave this relationship. I've, I'm mm -hmm. moving out. Uh, here's what we're doing with this. Here's what we're doing with that. Just letting you know. Mm -hmm. And by the way, don't call them so that you can hear their response. Leave it as mm -hmm. a voice note." or a written mm -hmm. note or an email mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. then block yeah. because the only thing you're getting from them is toxic abuse. So the follow-up question is always going to be, but isn't that mean? If you were a little more mean, you probably wouldn't have ended up in a years long relationship being a punching bag. Mm. And then it's not meanness, it's self-protective and it's a boundary. Yeah, when we talk about mean, the the synonym is cruel, and and mm -hmm. cruel is the lighting and the suffering of another. Mm -hmm. The reason we are not telling a narcissist that they're a narcissist or we're leaving like we're like just so cold like that is not because we're delighting in their suffering. Mm -hmm. It is because we need to, as you said, protect the self. Mm -hmm. And so, it can feel mean when you protect yourself. It mm -hmm. can feel mean. If a person asks me for money and I say no, because I need to protect my material mm -hmm. resources, it could feel mean, mm -hmm. but it is not delighting in their suffering. Therefore, it is mm -hmm. not a form of cruelty. Therefore, we yeah. need to let go of this fear of coming off as mean or being mean. And we need mm -hmm. to get into protecting ourselves and our resources and our children. That is our job. Mm -hmm. And I love the way that you break things down, the way that you just described that about how the synonym is cruel and that you're not delighting in hurting the other person. It's self-protective. So what are the first next steps for someone who has gotten out of a relationship with a narcissist? Once you are out, now you can heal, mm -hmm. which means that if you're still there, mm. your healing will be retarded. It cannot move mm. as fast if you are in a relationship with a narcissist. The reason is because the narcissist is the anti-therapist. So everything I'm working with you on and we're healing you and getting you getting your thoughts positive, the narcissist will work to tear that down. And mm -hmm. they will tear down the fact that you're in therapy and they'll tear down the person you're in therapy with and how yeah. unqualified they are. So yeah. so it is very difficult to heal while someone is abusing you, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if I want to, yeah. to heal, but I'm getting scraped on the sidewalk. It doesn't make mm -hmm. sense. So mm -hmm. get away from the narcissist, then you can actually heal more rapidly. Mm -hmm. Step number one, in my opinion, is to enroll in my healing course yeah. and, uh, and, and do one-on-one -on -one sessions with me or a specialist mm -hmm. trained by me. Mm -hmm. um, we're moving quickly. We're, we're helping people to heal in a matter of months, just like mm -hmm. three to six months, any survivors uh, mm -hmm. to reach a state of being symptom-free from CPTSD. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so get into healing. That is, that is your main thing. Learn meditation, learn to be alone. Mm -hmm. Mm. don't seek Just another people... relationship oh yeah stay stay <laughs> alone for a period of time for sure just before the interview i was watching some of your videos on dealing with the smear campaign can you speak a little bit on how to handle a smear campaign yes um the smear campaign is universal first of all so mm. don't think oh my god this is only happening to me no, mm. anyone who is important gets torn down. They get maligned, mm -hmm. speared, and slandered. Uh, so this is an evidence that you're an important person. The narcissist smears you uh, because in their minds, their way of being worthy on the imaginary hierarchy uh, that mm -hmm. they have in their heads is to make sure that everyone else sees you as less worthy. Uh, so mm -hmm. they will spread lies about you. They will spread exaggerations about you and negative mm -hmm. uh, or disparaging true information about you. 
And so the smear campaign is not, not something that you should focus on. In order to uh, defeat the smear campaign, do not think you need to go out and spread the truth. Mm. I just got to go out. I gotta tell people I got to call mm. them. Let them know you what you're guilty. hearing about me. Is wrong. It just makes you. Yeah, it, it, they're already primed for that. So mm. so if they, if they had any doubt before you called them, when you start calling and defending yourself, now you look like whatever it is the narcissist said you were. Yeah. which is the bully, the abuser, the manipulator, the narcissist, whatever they accuse you of, you're reinforcing that by highlighting the smear. Mm -hmm. So so the best way to respond to a smear campaign is to not respond at all. It's hard, you but it's to, the best advice. You need to disconnect mm -hmm. from anyone who is infected by the toxic, uh, disgusting, false rumors that are being spread about you. Don't try to save those relationships, just disconnect from them. If there are any real ones, they'll come after you. They'll pursue mm -hmm. you. They'll call you. They'll say, hey, how are you doing? We want to hear from you. We care about you. Those are your real ones. They will yeah. come. Don't go mm -hmm. back trying to salvage connections. Just walk away from them all and go mm -hmm. be, <laughs> keyword of the interview, alone. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> by yourself for a period of yeah. time that means maybe you don't have your friends anymore maybe you don't have your family maybe mm -hmm. you don't have your job your church community whatever it was you got cut off from mm. but leave them in the past and start fresh mm. and as you pursue purpose you will meet people who are aligned with your purpose and mm -hmm. they become your tribe i repeat as you pursue purpose don't pursue people pursue mm -hmm. purpose you will meet people who are aligned with that purpose and they become your new tribe. Then you will rebuild a new tribe and a new reputation among new people that have no access to the narcissist and the narcissist has no access to them. Mm -hmm. Then as you grow in this new community with this new thing, there are now two schools of thought that exist. Over mm -hmm. here, you are amazing. You are a hero. And over here, you are apparently this villain in this small little group over here. And so now anyone from this group and people are fickle mm -hmm. now see that there's a new school of thought about you. And some of them may convert back over to mm -hmm. believing that you are true. But again, you're not trying to convince them. You're just living it. You're just mm -hmm. being it. The real thing over here, the healed version of yourself, the actualized version that pursues purpose over here. Yeah. That's how you over the smear campaign because now you're living a new life surrounded by people mm -hmm. who are reaffirming who you really are. Claire, you're yeah. amazing. You're this, you're that. We love you. We appreciate <laughs> oh, you. Thanks, Raymond. <laughs> that becomes your life. That becomes your reality. Those are your people. And anyone yeah. who doesn't reaffirm that, you mm -hmm. cut them out. One hundred percent. Such good advice. You just cut them out. Such good advice. So, Roman, where can people find you? What are your social media handles and your website? Uh, at Roman Zanoni on YouTube, at Roman Zanoni mm -hmm. on TikTok. And you've written a book? The book is called Mind. It's available on Amazon.com. You go through page by page. I talk a little bit about my story, mm -hmm. uh, but more so I tell you how to heal what you're going through. Uh, mm -hmm. Symptom by symptom. Uh, the book has things in it that probably have never been published in the world of psychology so okay. all of my discoveries uh mm. things like that for the past uh, couple of years you'll find in this book this book is life-changing so definitely uh, get a copy of it on amazon amazing thank you so much for being on the podcast roman really enjoyed talking to you yeah uh, i enjoyed being here you'll definitely have to have me back again in the future because there's so I much to talk will. about yeah 100 <laughs> thank you thank you claire